Good morning to all of you. I hope you're well for this last day. Unfortunately, Bernd Saugel had to go back to Germany in emergency, so unfortunately he will not be with me for speaking about uh, pulse counter analysis, and I disclose the following conflicts of interest, especially uh, with pulse and medical systems getting uh, for this presentation. What is uh, pulse counter analysis? In fact, Let's imagine a patient, for instance, in the operating room, because you'll see that it's the typical setting where such devices are used. And this patient is monitored with an uncalibrated pulse contour analysis device or pulse wave analysis device that's the same. What is it? In fact, these devices estimate, but likely you know that, cardiac output, stroke volume and cardiac output from the arterial pressure wave form. That's pulse contour. Pulse contour is the pressure wave form. How is it possible? In fact, it's based on the fact that intuitively you can understand that the stroke volume induces the systolic part of the arterial pressure waveform. Then, of course, during diastole, the aorta empties and blood pressure goes down. But this initial part, I mean the systolic part, which means before the diacritic notch, is related in a way to stroke volume. The waveform itself, the geometry of the curve, and its amplitude at the aortic level is related to stroke volume. Something else must be bear in mind. In fact, what we measure at the bedside, it's not the aortic pressure, of course, it is the peripheral pressure. And you know by physiology that the amplitude of the blood pressure signal is amplified from the central aortic level to the peripheral level. And so what is true at the aortic level, the relationship between the amplitude and the waveform of pulse pressure, of, um, um, of um, arterial pressure and stroke volume, is not true at the peripheral level. This pulse wave amplification phenomenon must be taken into account. And this phenomenon, very important, depends on arterial resistance. Then how does it work? How do such devices estimate stroke volume? Basically, they measure the peripheral arterial waveform, analyze the geometrical properties of the curve with a specific software, and especially it must perfectly detect the diacritic notch. It's very important. Then it estimates stroke volume, and then it's multiplied by heart rate, and cardiac output is um, displayed. In fact, for doing so, there are very various algorithms, software that can be used. And by the way, they, they are, the, the way they function is kept secret by the constructors, of course. That's quite different depending on the uh, software. But just to give you an example, one of the most used is this three-element Windkessel model. Just to give you an idea, we will not go into technical details, of course, but the system computes the arterial pressure waveform at the periphery with this very sophisticated software. Then, it estimates from the radial pressure, the aortic pressure, and then it estimates stroke volume by building a model, the Windkessel model, by analogy with an electrical circuit where resistance and compliance and impedance play an important role. And it makes C, R, and Z vary to estimate flow from the supposed aortic pressure. You understand? These are these four steps that are required by these devices. 
If you want to know much more in these details, you can read this uh, review by uh, Bernd Zaugel. It really explains into details what is pulse contour analysis and, and the way these different algorithms function. So I suggest you read it if you want to know it in, in better details, in more details. Anyway, what is the advantage of pulse contour analysis compared to the other, uh, the other techniques measuring cardiac output? There are two main advantages. The first is that the devices estimate stroke volume at each arterial beat, okay? At each arterial beat, you have stroke volume, which means, and of course it is averaged over a moving average of a 12 or 20 seconds, which means that you have a continuous display of cardiac output. It changes on the screen from second to second, which means that you're able to assess short-term changes in stroke volume. And the second advantage is the precision of the devices. I mean that you can detect very small changes. The smallest detectable change, what's called the least significant change, is one or two percent. It means that you're able to detect cardiac output changes as small as two percent. So continuous and very precise, and these are very big advantages, especially if you want to assess preload responsiveness by the different tests that have been developed. It doesn't work, I'm sorry, I checked it just before. And we'll speak about that with Professor Mayatra here at 11 o'clock, the different ways to assess preload responsiveness with the ventilator in practice. What's this uh, movie was supposed to show you is that cardiac index here, okay, continuous cardiac index, changes from second to second, and as, for instance, the end expiratory occlusion test is 15 seconds long, you need something that reacts very rapidly, and at the diagnostic threshold is 5%, you need a very precise measurement of cardiac output. So typically, it's not the only way, but that's a very convenient way to assess such tests. The same for a fluid challenge, for instance. It's 15 minutes long, you want to detect even small changes, that's perfectly appropriate. So you see, in general, this is pulse wave analysis, and these are its advantages. Now, you know that there are some calibrated and uncalibrated devices. What are we speaking about? These are some of the devices, I think, the devices that are now uh, on the market and that estimate cardiac outputs with pulse contour analysis. And all these devices are not the same. You have some externally calibrated devices, typically so the lead coplas is not commercialized anymore, but the Pico or the Hemosphere, Pico from Göttinger and Hemosphere from Edwards, some internally calibrated devices, and among them minimally invasive, so needing an arterial catheter, and non-invasive devices, and something which is um, very particular, which is the Italian must care system, which is not calibrated. And these devices, again, are not the same and do not work in the same way. To speak more simply, one says there are some calibrated devices and non-calibrated devices. It's a bit the same. You will understand what I'm speaking about. So all the devices are not the same, and you will see that it's very important. Just a slide on this most care system. It's developed by an Italian company, an Italian company. And, um, well... Initially, it estimates stroke volume, and the estimation of stroke volume is reperformed at each cardiac beat. It's continuously re-estimated. They say there is no calibration. You will understand the difference with, for instance, the other internally calibrated devices. For instance, with these devices here, 
So the uh, flow track, the ProAct PulsoFlex, Litco Rapid on the new uh, August device. There is an initial estimation of stroke volume by a complex analysis of the arterial pressure, pressure waveform and its comparison with a large database of arterial pressure waveforms recorded in some patients. And after this initial estimation, stroke volume is continuously estimated and re-corrected to adapt. So you see there is an initial estimation that's called the internal calibration. It's not a calibration, it's an initial estimation. Whatever the way, it's not very important. What's totally different are the non-invasive devices, and today on the market, we have the clear sight device by Edwards. It's a non-calibrated or internally calibrated devices that estimates stroke volume totally in a totally non-invasive way, just with a cuff that is wrapped around a finger. How is it possible? In fact, within this cuff, you have two elements. The first is a pneumatic cuff that is surrounding the finger. And the second element is a plat sensor, platysmography sensor. And as you know, um, platysmography measures the volume of oxygenated hemoglobin, okay? Which means that it measures the volume of the finger arteries. And the system works in this way. At each time, it senses that the volume of the finger arteries increases, the pneumatic cuff around inflates in order to keep the platysmography signal constant, you see? So it senses that the arteries dilate because of the heartbeat, of course. Immediately, the pneumatic cuff increases and, of course, it deflates at diastole. And all the, pr the principle is that the pressure in the cuff is proportional to the pressure in the finger arteries. Understand? It's quite clever. Huh? And then it is um, adapted to the arterial pressure you measure with the cuff. It's calibrated with the pressure you measure with the cuff. And it gives you a continuous arterial pressure waveform. So it's not a brachial cuff, and it gives you really the arterial curve. It's able to measure pulse pressure, it's able to measure pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation, because from this curve, it performs pulse contour analysis. You understand? So in fact, there are two things in this device. First, a non-invasive estimation of arterial pressure. And second, pulse contour analysis. So it's a non, one of the two non-invasive devices we have. We have bioreactants and these systems, it's called finger cuff devices. They are called finger cuff devices or volume clamp devices because this technique is called volume clamp. And again, for the moment, that's the only device on the market. Okay, so one may say that all this is not calibrated. Now we move to the calibrated devices and now it's totally different. These devices estimate cardiac output basically from another technique which is transpulmonary semidilution. It's the PICO device or the hemosphere device and you likely know these devices, you need a standard arterial venous, ca uh, central venous catheter, which is a normal one, and a specific arterial catheter, specific because there is a thermometer at the tip of the catheter. It's called the thermistance. And at each time you inject a cold bolus in the circulation, it measures stroke volume or cardiac output. In fact, it uses, so it records the temperature difference you induce, and the blood refreshes, of course. It records it and uses the Stuart Hamilton principle. It's quite simple. If cardiac output is high, you have a, a very high peak of the curve. 
if cardiac output is low, the curve is, is long and smooth, okay? That's the Stuart Hamilton principle. It's the same way of estimating cardiac output as with a pulmonary artery catheter. It's reliable. It's intermittent, I mean you need to, in, you need to inject a cold bonus, and it's not very precise. The smallest change you can trust is 10-15%, uh, so it's not that precise. Nevertheless, at each time you inject a cold bonus, you estimate cardiac output, the true value of cardiac output. And then, at the same time, these devices estimate cardiac output from pulse contour analysis, because they are connected to an arterial line. But this time, the initial estimation is calibrated. What does it mean? I told you that stroke volume is, let's say, proportional to the pink area here. But of course, there is a, a multiplicating factor. There is a key factor, okay? The millimeters, the squared millimeters of the pink area are not equal to the milliliters of stroke volume. When one says it's calibrated, it's because at each time you perform transpulmonary thermodilution, you estimate the true value of stroke volume. At the same time, the device knows the pink area or the amplitude, and so it knows the key factor. This is calibration. The estimation of stroke volume is calibrated with a reference method, which is transpulmonary thermodilution. Do you understand? And then, at each, so when you do the thermodilution, you have the true value of stroke volume. And then at each arterial beat, it uses the same calibrating factor. Okay? These are calibrated devices, meaning calibrated by transpulmonary thermodilution. Finally, I'm sorry for this complex. Uh, yes, please. How often needed to calibrate? How often needed to calibrate? It's a very good question. I was going to speak about that later, but it's good. Indeed, the problem of pulse control analysis is that it drifts away from the true value of cardiac output after dozens of minutes. And so regularly, you need to recalibrate the system in order to reset it to the true value of cardiac output. You're right. Usually one says after one hour, it has drifted to a significant extent. It's an average, okay? And also, it drifts away when the resistance of the arteries changes. Why? Because, for instance, you, you give norepinephrine to your patient. As you know, you change the wave form of the artery, of the arterial curve. And so the system is, uh, it doesn't know stroke volume anymore. You must recalibrate it. So to answer your question directly, you must recalibrate typically when the last calibration was made more than, has been made more than one hour ago. And when the arterial resistance changes, typically you change the dose of norepinephrine. I said to finish this quite complex part of my talk, one word about the PulsioFlex device, because it's a non-calibrated device, but you can enter a value of cardiac output that to estimate, for instance, with echography. So there is no thermodilution to calibrate the system, but I do echo, I measure cardiac output, you know, VTI, area of the um, LV outflow tract. And manually, I enter the value of cardiac output and the system is calibrated. Do you understand what I say? So you, well, it's not very easy because you have to measure cardiac output with echo and then you enter it in the device and then you have a calibrated value of cardiac output that's continuously displayed and that's specific to the ProAct PulsioFlex device. Anyway, most importantly, and that's very, very important to have in mind, the limitation of the devices is not the same depending on the device. Why? 
Of course, stroke volume is not arterial pressure. Of course, it's the relationship is influenced by the properties of the artery, of the arterial system. What's between the peripheral artery and the aortic valve? It means the resistance and the compliance of arterial pressure. This, is, this must be the case by physiology. It cannot be exactly the same. And for instance, with the Windkessel model I showed you at the beginning, I told you that aortic pressure is estimated by peripheral arterial pressure, but this relationship is influenced by resistance. I told you that at the beginning. And I told you that the model takes into account resistance and compliance. So you understand that the estimation of flow from the peripheral artery must be influenced by resistance and compliance of the arterial system. And this is why when resistance changes, uncalibrated systems are lost for estimating cardiac output. They are less reliable. And that's inherent to the way they work. It's been demonstrated by many studies. Just an example, in this study, when we gave fluid no change in arterial resistance, the changes in cardiac output were pretty well tracked. The percentage of error, whatever it is, was above 30%, which is the normal limit or the acceptable limit. When we change the dose of norepinephrine, so change in arterial resistance, it increases a lot. In that study by the team of Maxime Canesson, the same. They changed preload, the concordance rate, so the percentage of cases where both systems indicate a variation to the same direction is good, much less if they give norepinephrine or even phenylephrine. Just on the left panel, you see that when the true value of cardiac output increases, the uncalibrated system says cardiac output decreases. So it's the other direction, okay? It's a big mistake in 80% uh, of the cases. And you see it's different when arterial pressure resistance changes. And perhaps even more illustrating uh, or illustrative in that study, the bias between an uncalibrated system and the reference is directly influenced by the systemic vascular resistance. And that's again inherent to the way the systems work. If resistance changes, parts control analysis makes mistakes for estimating cardiac output. And then that's the advantage of calibrated devices that if the value drifts away from the true value, you can, you can reset it to the uh, true value, which is not possible with, um, with uncalibrated system. So, should I choose a calibrated or an uncalibrated system for my unit? You could make the conclusion yourself. In fact, it all depends on the setting. For instance, for the operating room, typically, you know, we should monitor a cardiac output in high-risk surgical patients. The anesthesiologist may be interested by non-calibrated systems. Why? It is easier to use. You just need an arterial line, a radial arterial line, or even you use the clear side, which is non-calibrated. It is less expensive, which is, of course, important for the number of uh, interventions you do uh, every year. By the way, it gives you less information. You have only cardiac output and stroke volume variation and heart rate, but okay, it's not. Uh, so only two pieces of information. But it is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, and it is less reliable. On the contrary, in the ICU, you will use calibrated devices. Why? They are more reliable, 
you can recalibrate this, the value. The price and the invasiveness is acceptable for ICU patients. And it provides more information because by transpulmonary thermodilution, when you inject a cold bolus, you know that these devices give you um, global and diastolic volume, lung water, lung permeability, cardiac contractility, many pieces of hemodynamic information, which these devices do not give you. But perhaps you don't need that for a surgical intervention. What do you need here? Just to monitor the patient, continuous value. You need to know when to give fluid, PPV, SVV. And uh, when you give fluid, if cardiac output increases or not. It's much more complex in ICU patients, of course. So you see not the same indications. And that's why this consensus conference of the Euro European Society in 2014 said, monitor cardiac output not for all the patients, for the patients that do not respond to initial therapy, so meaning the most severe patients where you increase the dose of norepinephrine, etc. And it suggested to use what? To use either transpulmonary thermodilution, calibrated system, or the pulmonary artery catheter. We are updating this consensus conference, and the update will be published in the next weeks in intensive care medicine. And I can tell you that these are quite the same recommendations. So you see different indications for different patients, these systems are not the same. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Uh, do you have any comments on uh, uh, the temperature of the fluids for the pickle? For calibration? Calibration. Any comment? <laughs> like, I understand your question. In fact, uh, you should use a cold bolus, huh? and usually, typically, below 10, um, degree, 10 Celsius degrees, okay? Below 10. So it means you should use saline that's in the fridge. It's been said in a few studies that you can use saline at room temperature. Nevertheless, I suggest to use the system as it was uh, conceived from the beginning, so to use cold boluses. Okay. That was your question, right? Um, my question is, what's your personal opinion on calibrated devices in patients um, with persistent arterial, fibri arterial fibrillation? Oh, very good question. In fact, some people say, in case of atrial fibrillation, pulse contour analysis is not reliable. It's not true. In fact, yes, the system estimates stroke volume at each heartbeat, so it's very variable from a beat to another. Okay? And so the value you see on the screen varies a lot. And that's why people say, oh, it's not reliable. Yes, it is reliable, because cardiac output indeed changes a lot from a beat to another. Then, I told you, perhaps you remember that, that in fact the system do not display stroke volume at each heartbeat. They average it, otherwise you could not read it on the monitor, it would be. So they average it on 12 or 20 seconds. So it is the signal is smoothed a bit, but still you see some variations. But these are true variations. It's not very good because, of course, if you want to detect, for, you do, for instance, um, passive leg grazing, then it's difficult to see what is the true change. And some new devices now allow you to increase the averaging time so that you take into account more heartbeats and you have a more stable value, okay? But to answer your question directly, the systems are still reliable. And yes, you see a very uh, uh, cardiac output that changes a lot, but that's the true cardiac output. So that's a very important question. <laughs>
Um, you said before, uh, for the calibrated system, you have to do the calibration of the device every uh, hour, or if there is a big change in, uh, the, res in the resistance. Uh, in practice, in your ICU, you do that? Because, for example, in my ICU, we are doing that um, every six hours, for example, or if there is a big change in the resistance. You're right, in fact. I'm not saying in, in, in my ICU, the nurses do not go to the patient and calibrate every hour, otherwise this would be fluid loading, eh? continuous fluid loading, and this would represent liters in the end of the day. No. It's more than, it's more. When the patient becomes unstable, I come to the patient, I look at the time from the last calibration, if it's more than one hour, then I recalibrate the system. And in any way, for deciding what to do, I need preload, lung water, lung... so in any way I do some dilution. So it's only if the patient is unstable that I redo calibration. That, that's an important practical message. Thank you. What about the peripheral resistances? I mean, they are uh, measured, calculated, estimated. Are they reliable or we should look for something different? Very good question again, thank you. You mean systemic vascular resistance calculated by the devices? If you trust cardiac output, arterial pressure and CVP measurements, it's reliable, okay? You need CVP, by the way. You need um, uh, cardiac output and, uh, and mean arterial pressure. So it is as reliable as cardiac output. Nevertheless, I think and... Uh, some believe that this systemic vascular resistance should not be taken into account. I know that many of you look at SVR, but it's not the good way to do why. It's a rough estimate of systemic vascular resistance. When you do so, mean arterial pressure, CVP, you do as if the resistance was the same in the arteries and in the vein you neglect the waterfall phenomenon that may appear at the arterial levels, level, arterioles level. So in fact, it's not physiology. Considering this as one duct is wrong, okay? And we rather suggest that you use the diastolic arterial pressure because it is physiologically related to what? To the arterial tone. Arterial, and that's what you want to do. You don't, I guess, you don't care the venous tone, okay? So arterial tone is indicated by diastolic arterial pressure. So in my practice, I never look at SVR. We look at diastolic blood pressure, which is more physiological for indicating resistance. I mean arterial resistance. Perhaps last question, because I think we have finished. What about uh, spontaneous breathing patients? Thank you. Spontaneous breathing patient. Another common thought. It's not reliable in spontaneously breathing patients. No. The same, of course, cardiac output may vary quite a lot because the patient is spontaneously breathing. In fact, people make a confusion. Yes, PPV and stroke volume variation are not indicative of preload responsiveness. That's sure but cardiac output remains, remains the right value, okay? And people, you, you understand, they make a confusion. No, oh, PPV and SVV don't work in case of spontaneous breathing, so all the, no, no, no. Again, pulse control analysis is not influenced, or the reliability is not influenced by breathing. It's a very important question as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Have a nice morning.